So, um, this presentation will be in English, so let me introduce Carl Schottini. And we actually just met today in the morning, and I'm really very happy to meet you, and thank you for accepting to give lectures in one day. And it's been a hard work for you, <laughs> sorry about that. So, Carl uh, Schottini, in her own words, can I refer yes, you? Sir. Is an architectural urbanist, researcher, and educator, teaching and practicing between the UK and Australia. Uh, as far as I understood, you now moved to London like a permanent. Yes, yes. That's, that's actually landed from my mother, but yes, I am permanently in London. So she was uh, working and researching, teaching uh, between. Um, Sydney uh, University of Technology and uh, the RCA Royal, Royal College of Art uh, in London. I think now she is based in Royal College of uh, Art. And she has taught at uh, and conducted projects at Architectural Association and Bartlett uh, as well. And uh, Harsha's primary research traject trajectory considers the social, political, spatial reasoning underpinning urbanism and the city of modernity and its relationship to the material and formal practice of the discipline of uh, architecture. Uh, her uh, doctoral thesis titled Repetition and Transformation, the Housing Project and the City of New York. 1930 to 1973, which we listened to today in the morning, uh, considered large scale complex housing interventions in the city of New York through the middle of the 20th uh, century. We had a very nice output on uh, the theory of the relationship between uh, form and function, architecture and ground, and how. Uh, urban space it has been uh, transformed uh, in the housing projects of New York City. And more recently, Tarsha has been involved in research, examining housing, special performance and diversity, and demographic change in the cities of Sydney, Hong Kong, and London, in addition to uh, New York, and the role of governance and ownership structures in the constitution and special performance of place in cities. She is also currently holding the position of the uh, co-editing of a special edition of the Journal of Architecture uh, titled Architectural Type and Discourse of Urbanism. And we are very thankful uh, to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, thank you to the School of Architecture for hosting me. Uh, to those of you that were in the lecture this morning, congr congratulations for still being here. <laughs> and I think the really heady work was done this morning in a discussion around, I think it was clear how we, how as part of a research group at the Architectural Association, um, along with some colleagues, uh, Dr. Katerina Gorsi and Dr. Pavlos Filipu, led by Lawrence Barth, who's still at the AA. We were developing up notions of how to understand um, architecture as a discipline, as a way of understanding a, a particular kind of formal and material practice that's, a, that's emerged within modernity, that has a, a particular iterative and limited agency in terms of something we call the discourse of urbanism. And I'm not going to talk to you about any of those kind of theoretical things today. What I'm going to do is position that thinking more broadly um, in terms of how it means we're approaching a 15-month master's called City Design and what that means at the Royal College of Art, and then also what it means for the way that we're looking at contemporary housing and where we start to notice and look at, um, at understanding change. And really what that comes down to is um, understanding what it means to speak about the new in architecture, right? Because I think 
one of the things that we're very bad at in architecture, the great irony of the field, is that we define ourselves in terms of novelty and newness. And we're surrounded by sort of novel churn in facade structures and systems. But really, at this fundamentally, the diagrammatic um, patterning that we're working with, whether that's the cultural building or the housing project or the penitentiary or the asylum, um, these things remain reasonably stable through time. And you can see that from the sort of, depending on which of these you're looking at in the cultural building, you can see that from the middle of the 19th century into the contemporary. So despite the titanium cladding that someone like Frank Gehry uses, fundamentally the plan of the cultural building remains reasonably stable. So what we're struck by is a whole series of huge things coming at us from the outside, which I'm going to speak about in the context of the city design program, things like climate change and weather volatility, the need for resilience, um, population growth, um, aging, demographic change in terms of aging populations, and equally big transformations in labour, in the economy and the way that labour works relative to robotics and artificial intelligence, for example. And we need to understand better uh, and, and make housing work better for us. But to do that, we've got to understand how we how we affect change in architecture. So that's something to speak about. So this is sort of more broadly work that we're doing in the program. But what I want to speak to you about now, just initially, is I want to position that within the program of city design. Because I think that's that's where we're starting to think through um, how one, what the pedagogy of this is and how one brings around the table many disciplines. It's a multidisciplinary program. It's 15 months long. It's not only architecture, but we understand and we're making an argument that it's the architectural drawing that's the thing that ena enables us to negotiate difference. We see the design process as being really key to that. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a kind of shouty spiel that we talk about the program, just to give you a sense of where we're positioning ourselves. So when we talk about cities, we usually think of things like this, you know? It's a city, it's New York, you would recognise that New York, of course, is important because it's the city that we propose to ourselves as being all of what modernity promises, and then equally at the same time through the 20th century, all of its failure. And then there's a city like this, equally as important. This is the Hutong around the edges of the Imperial City of Beijing. It's the small laneway structures that where all the families that serve the Imperial family lived. It's the city like this, which is so iconic, the urban core of Los Angeles with its suburb, low rise suburban spread. And of course, the city like this, the informal city of the favela of Caracas. And of course, despite the fact that as architects and urbanists, we're so completely mesmerised by these um, informal settlements. We know that they are as rule-bound and as rule-developed as any other city that we work with. And then because more often than not, we're all living in cities like this. This is a, a nameless city in Asia somewhere. It's probably in Taiwan or Korea. But of course, it's this city of suburban spread that marks um, most of the development in cities in the middle of the 20th century in the developed world. This is Levittown in New York. It's the moment where the machinery of warfare turned from the production of armaments toward the production um, of domesticity in the domestic realm. So um, there is a considerable body of writing now that says that the single family dwelling in the modern family, in fact, really only solidify and emerge in the mid-teens of the 20th century, so 1912, 1920, there's a considerable amount of experimentation still going on on how we organise ourselves collectively. But by the end of World War II, in 1945, that all changes, and this really solidifies and calcifies into a formidable economic and social structure. But more often than not, we're seeing images like this, and I always find these incredibly seductive. It's the image of climate change, of weather volatility, it's it's sublime in a sense in the way that it re-images, um, it re-imagines what's possible in the city, even if it is this beautiful sort of pond that happens in the suburbs, despite all of the tragedy that goes with that. And of course, I just find images like this always so seductive, so horrific in another sense. But more and more during Hurricane Katrina and in the aftermath of the levee breaking, 
we started to see images like this, and we saw images like this, and we saw images like this, and images like this. And it is unbelievable to me that it's a country with the reputation of America and what I understand to be a resilience of civil society enabled or allowed this to happen. And to me, what it shows and what's interesting about it isn't climate change, though of course this is tragic. It's the fact that um, civil society has been so white anted, right? It's been so eaten out from the middle, and that there's only a very thin veneer left on the outside that this was able to happen. And so we ask ourselves, in the light of that, and with a kind of concern about well, what does that mean if we know that the climate is becoming more volatile, if we know that our population centers, our cities are becoming larger and larger, and of course in Istanbul, with your population of what is it, 18 to 20 million, um, that you know, that is, places such an incredible burden on infrastructure and system, we need to ask ourselves, what is the city? And of course, of geography, sociology, many of the planning, town planning will tell us it's networks of flow, of infrastructure, of freight movement, of people movement. It's iconic structures that are about spectacle, interspersed with the finality of the public-private split in the city. And then it's just this, it's just the housing, this is in Hong Kong. But we think more and more that the question of what is the city, of course, needs to be asked at the same time with an understanding of the notion of power, right? Because I understand that what's stated in the diagram, so the diagram of domesticity, or some of the diagrams that we were speaking about um, this morning, which was the neighbourhood unit, is a question of socio-political power, of how within modernity, We've begun to organise bodies in space with particular reasonings, with particular arguments about who we are together. And when I speak about power, I don't mean this kind of power. This is the power of violence. And it's a very short, sharp, fast-lived power. It's not the power that I'm speaking about. There's a different kind of power. And we think it's the power that is involved in these kind of institutional forms. And of course, you probably recognise this as being a, um, a, it's the plan of asylum. We all have, you know, you will be familiar with the writings of uh, a philosopher like Michel Foucault who speaks about the role of the insane, insane asylum in a certain kind of um, development of a certain kind of subjectivity. But what I'm much more interested in is this plan, and this is the plan of domesticity that emerges in the middle of the 19th century and is really generalised and normalised by the 19 teens. Now, just to give you a very quick description of what this is, this is actually two plans that are split down the middle, made very famous by a writer called Robert Evans um, in an essay that he published in the 1970s. What, what's, what needs to be noted about this, first of all, is that it's two dwellings that are separated by a staircase such that families can come up and down and never really have to interact with each other that for the first time what appears is a hierarchy of spaces that start to define roles and subjectivities. The subject position of mother, father, husband, wife, boy child, girl child, sister, brother, daughter, son. All of these positions, all these roles and titles come with expectations, norms, etiquettes of behaviour. And they're positioned in hierarchies of space relative to each other. So you'll note, oh, there's two, you'll note that there's oh, two bedrooms. Two bedrooms of equal size, one for a boy child, one for a girl child. There's a larger bedroom from the parents. It's separated slightly from the living room by the kitchen, which now is for the first time inside. The bedroom, of course, is separated because that's where the danger of sexuality happens. That's where the forbidden and illicit relationship of the parents comes together, away from the children that need to be kept um, isolated from that. Of course, childhood at this stage is a new condition. Prior to this, children were just understood to be small adults. There was no age of childhood as such. And everyone comes back together in the living room in a kind of relationship of surveillance where one uh, cultivates oneself in one's own space and comes back together and performs that identity together and, and in surveillance and in relationship to other people. So knowing that then, if that's what's at stake in the plan, for us what we're going is what is at stake in this plan, right? Because when we look at this drawing and we look at the kind of provision of housing that we've got, despite a whole lot of effervescence around the edge, 
fundamentally, the most contemporary housing plans that you look at will be a variation on that. It may just be that there's more air and more space between them, which is it doesn't make them less like this. It makes them more of an articulation of this. And so what, what I'm really interested in is if we're confronted by a whole series of things like this that we're framing the city design program in, how do we find the conditions of experimentation to begin to push that apart? Because what you start to realise when you look at this plan is that it's not just a space that's at stake. It's also our subjectivities, ourselves that are at stake in the changing. And so it's not a thing that can just be done from nothing, right? It, the new doesn't come on a tabula rasa surface. The new is a thing that emerges through translation. So, so just to step back a bit, in city design, we think that these are things we need to be worried about. And, I, and I'm just going to run through them with you. I'm just going to run through them with you really quickly. Um, and bear in mind, and I apologise for this, these are things that are reasonably specific to developed world cities. There are some things that will resonate with you, but others of them you'll find when you think through what you know about Istanbul, Istanbul will be in a different cycle, in a different stage in the cycle. And so I'll be interested to speak about this at the end. So first of all, what do we know about, does anyone know what all of these cities have in common? Anyone want to guess? Anyone want to guess what it, no? These are the fastest growing cities through to 2100. So I don't know about you, but I don't know almost any of them at the time. Nairobi and Lagos and Delhi, but the rest of them pretty much I don't know of them at all. And so these are all the cities that have emerged with the largest populations coming through. And in the next 33 years, we'll have to build cities for an additional 2.5 billion people, 2.5 billion people. Right? Think about how we're struggling with doing just the number of people we need now. Which is equal to a new United Kingdom and Ireland every year, which is slightly ridiculous to say in a forum like this because it's only 60 million people a year, right? And I think the, you know, the, the, the cities in this region are much larger than that. But it's equal to a new Barcelona every week. And I think that what's interesting about that, and you will know this, is that Barcelona, of course, is the model that we hold up mostly in urbanism and urban design as being one of the great city plans. And if you think about what's interesting about Barcelona is that it is both a plan with an argument, but it's also a lived artifact that's transformed through time. And it's that, it's that, um, it's the, it's the temporality of that unfolding through time, which of course what all this suggests is we have none of. So every week that's 280,000 houses, 24,000 six story buildings, 2,000 60 story buildings every week. So of course what we're all asking ourselves is what will it look like? What can we contribute to that? Who will design it? Who will build it? And what quality of life will it, will, will it make possible? But also, of course, there's a huge increase in the value of the global construction industry. And two out of three of those dollars are going to be spent in this region, in Africa and Asia. They're not in Europe, not in North America, and not in Australia and the Pacific. But the other problem that we've got in cities like the, the three cities that I work in, right? So that's London, Sydney, and Hong Kong, is the question of aging populations. And I don't know whether that's an issue in Istanbul, but I think we're all facing it. Uh, people born today will have a life expectancy of over 100 years. Uh, by 2050, the number of over 65s will quadruple from 600 million to 2.1 billion. But this is the most important figure, and this is the figure that's been compared to climate change in, term, in terms of its urgency. So for the eight largest economies, uh, that is that to service this um, coming group of older people, it's going to require savings and pensions of $400 trillion. That's five times the size of the current global economy. And so we don't know how to house those people. We don't have the resources. Government doesn't have the resources to look after them. And for a whole lot of reasons to do with transforming um, labour forces and transforming economies, we're losing the traditional mechanisms we have for looking after each other as we got older, which is our family. So quite equally, there's another sort of funny thing going on to do with um, housing affordability and um, the question of young people in housing in London and Sydney, Hong Kong particularly. And that's to do with the cost of housing and housing affordability. I don't think that you're in the same position here yet, though I'm really interested to hear if that's the case. And so if you look at these figures, this is from 2015. 
But even more recently, which is this is in Sunday's Financial Times, um, the this Financial Times, you know, this is a conservative economic newspaper, is starting to talk about something that they're calling hostile cities, and that is cities that are making it impossible for their existing populations and their young people particularly to be able to afford to remain living there. So what, what's happening is, is there's, they're identifying a series of cities. So Shanghai, Sydney, Hong Kong, San Francisco, Paris, London, New York, Tokyo, that are becoming, because of a series of um, events since the global financial crisis in 2008, are, coming, are becoming a kind of magnet for capital, right? So because we've got strong rule of law, there, there is money being made in countries all around the world with a less strong rule of law from, um, from Asia, from the Middle East, from Africa, that is coming and investing itself in these cities, particularly in putting enormous pressure on housing affordability and prices, and then also on, um, therefore, the ability of existing populations and people to sustain themselves in those cities, which has a whole lot of consequences for things like key worker housing and for, um, for young people. And what's interesting about that is that the UK government, for example, is making an argument that young people need to be involved in the creative economy. But we know that to be creative, to be involved in an innovative economy, to be part of the creative um, industry that you guys are going to be part of, one needs to be able to take risks. And if you're paying more than 50% of your income in mortgages or rent, it's just impossible to take risks. And so there's this a growing realisation of the dampening effect that that's happening on an economy like the UK's to begin to um, engage properly with um, the true potential of young people. And, and the, the modern economy needs flexibility and mobility, right, which begins to then also have a whole lot of consequences for family structures um, and what's going on in the centre of cities and the concentration of cities. It means that the support structures we once would have relied on uh, are no longer existing because people are becoming so mobile. So one of the responses, of course, and I'm sure there's something similar in, in Turkey, and I only know this because I listened into a conversation that someone was having in a bar last night where I was sitting on a table next to them. They were talking about new aged care homes in, in Istanbul and aged care. So it's, I, I hear people speaking about this, it's an issue here. But one of the responses we've had in London and Sydney, for example, is to say we no longer think that it's appropriate to institutionalise old people. I mean, why would you want to send them into an old people's home? It's horrible. I don't want to go there. What is better is if people can age at home. Everyone wants to stay at home. But there's a whole lot of consequences of that. The, the standard response is that governments then send care into the home which is someone drops in a couple of times a day to bathe an old person, to, to drop in food, to drop in for a conversation, but it's leading to this great existential crisis of isolation and loneliness. People are lonely and they're sad, and that has a whole lot of consequences then also for life expectancy. So we're in this terrible bind, right, of how do we, what are we doing with our housing? The, the commercial, development market is just replicating over and over studio one, two and three bedroom apartments. They're not working for families, they're not working for us as we get older, we're not given any options, right? So these, this is where we're positioning ourselves with, um, with city design. So, so we start the program, so that's the program roughly, and I'm going to just speak to you now about where we believe that there's some answers to this and where we might find some solutions. So one of the things we're looking at globally is where do we find the conditions for innovation in housing? And so this is where the talk I gave this morning comes in, where we understand that, um, that there is particular there are particular conditions that are needed to begin to think about experimentation. It's not just, as I said, a kind of tabula rasa event where um, at one avant-garde architect produces something new. It has to be um, a, a um, process and a condition of experimentation which has a relationship between experiments in drawing, um, a lived experience of new ways of being together, that then feeds back into a design process, and you have this very rich iterative relationship between, between things. Now, we think that globally, there's a series of um, projects and developments that are doing this. So I want to show you this project. This is 
in Zurich. It's a cooperative started in the 1980s by an anarchist youth group. It's called Craftwork. And I want to just describe to you what you're looking at. Right? Because if you look at this, this doesn't look at all like the three bedroom apartment that I showed you, right? There is, just so that you can read it, because it's quite tricky, is that there are five bedrooms. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. Each of them has a kitchenette and an ensuite bathroom. And then they share a large kitchen and a dining room and a living room together. But just let me tell you about who's living in this apartment. So in this apartment here is a woman over the age of 65. She's single. This one is a woman over the age of 65. She's single. This is a single parent with a child under the age of 11. This is another single parent with a child under the age of 11. And this is a couple who are at university together. So there are 11 people living in this apartment together. And they share um, a, a large kitchen, a large table, and they share a living space. Now, when I went into this apartment block, they said, I said, well, you know, do you ever use the micro kitchens, these little tiny kitchens that exist here? Because that, they, of course, that's the, that's the safety valve, right? That's the, that's the risk of the elevator. The kitchens were built in case no one liked each other and they didn't want to eat together, right? Because everyone was concerned, how is this group going to get on? You know, today? How are they going to navigate as autonomous, independent adults? They're not students. There's one couple who are a student. The rest of you. So you can't say they're flatmates, right? So what are they? So they said, no, 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 we don't use the micro kitchen. We don't, you know, we never use them. We prefer to have storage. We just eat together. So we have a roster. Seven nights a week, someone cooks. And, you, you know, we share the groceries and we work all these things out. And I think this is just completely fascinating. So this project, um, this is a full floor plate. So on the full floor plate, you have uh, two of these apartments. So two cluster apartments on every floor and a more conventional apartment that separates it. There, at the scale of the building block, there are two circulation systems. One internal stair, which is very wide and generous and quite functional. But we, and, and, a, and a lift, and that's for going up and down quickly. And then you've got this very lazy external series of ramps and, and, and slower staircases, which is where the, um, the households have their outside space for eating in summer. Um, and where this project really affected me, where I was really touched by it, I was like, oh my, I can see something really interesting happening to it, which is going to sound sort of very banal, but the woman that showed me around said, oh, you know, someone, one of the residents in the ground floor of the building, a, an older man had had a stroke, you know, he had what, a brain and he, and he, so he was receiving care at home a couple of times a day. In the morning, someone would come to watch him, you know, the, the usual scenario of providing um, social services into the home. But he couldn't cook for himself anymore and there was no one to cook him dinner. He had no one to eat with. So the um, cluster apartments in the whole building, so there's 10 of them, a two per floor, got together and have a roster. So every seven days, there's someone cooking dinner that he can go and have dinner with. And to me, there's a written into the logic of the block, a kind of degree of social care that we don't have at the moment in housing. Now, to me, what's really interesting about this, when you look at these, look at these apartments, going back to this, is that, you know, we don't know, like, what is the name for that woman over the age of 65 to that child under the age of 11? You know, what, what, who, who is that child to that woman? Or who is that child to these people? What's the name? We don't, you know, we've got mother, father, sister, brother, but we don't have another name for these people. And I think this is the real work of newness that's involved in here, is we can only work this out through the lived experience of developing the etiquettes and norms of relationship and behaviour to each other. And so I think the other thing about this, which is really interesting, and the reason why I think all of these projects are together, and that I'm going to speak to you about, is because key to all of these projects is the design process as the site of negotiating difference between groups of people. So in this, and the architect sits in a different position in each of the projects, but the design process is really key, and I'll finish with one in Barcelona where I think you can really see it. I think. Here the architect works for the cooperative, but also is, is a cooperative resident. So the, uh, she showed me around the building and is, is really involved in the development of the project. Um, 
But, but I think what's, but I'm just, just going to pause here for a minute and, and show you. So these are the two diagrams that, that I, I keep coming back and looking at. One's the single family dwelling that we spoke about, and the other is the neighborhood unit that we spoke about a lot more this morning. And these two are really key to the way that we understand um, these animating conditions of domesticity of a family or the animating condition of community. And it's these that we need to start pulling apart as we start to critique and understand better what's new and what's not. And I think what's interesting is that there's this great group of really fantastic new publications that have come out on housing, and I encourage you to find them if you don't already know them. If you're working in practice, any decent office that's working with housing will have these in their library. But I think each of them, they make this argument about how we should be dealing with all of these change conditions and housing's capacity to deal with it. And one group of them on the one hand says, actually, what we need to do is produce housing that's more flexible. All of you, I'm sure, in the studio will have made an argument for flexibility. We all do it. We have all done it. If we could just make the walls move, if we could make the whole apartments move, we could make another shipping containers, and we could move the shipping containers around. I know that someone has made arguments like that. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, there's one group that say that. That's what we need to do. The, 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 the apartments need to be more flexible. And then there's another group that say, no, 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 it's not the apartments, it's us. We need to be more flexible. We need to be the ones that are moving between houses, and the houses need to be specific, specific to life cycle. Um, and the most extreme version of that, I think, is this Tony Uito project called Power One and Two, the Nomadic Women of Tokyo. And here, what these women are doing is in, a, in an art installation piece is actually developing these very specific kinds of furniture, pieces of furniture that they move around the city. But I think that the mistake that both of these positions make is that what they misunderstand is actually the project of dynamism in either direction is the project of modernity itself. And fundamentally at work in this spatial arrangement and its socio-political performance is the constant demand that we make ourselves dynamic in the project of ourselves. So to engage with that requires that we have a really specific relationship to architecture's disciplinary practice. And so I'm going to show you a few more of these. So I'm just going to speak about innovations in these cluster apartments at the scale of the dwelling unit. So I've shown you that one, and I'll give you a bit more detail about this, the one in um, Kraftwerk. But these are all, oh, these are all uh, cluster apartments. These are all cooperatives. They're all cluster apartments. Craft work that I showed you is here. So you can see there's 11 people in there. The largest one I've looked at is in the River Spreefield Co-op in Berlin. And Kafka right now, I've heard a rumor, but I need to confirm it has something like 25 people living in one cluster. Um, there, and what's really interesting about these experiments is, of course, each one is asking each time, what is the size of the scale of this new collective of intimacy and care? How many people can negotiate different? Uh, so this is craft work, just to show you this. Um, this is the project I just described in detail. You can see the plan that's a ground floor plan there. It's, if this is Zurich and the lake is here, it's right on the edge, so it's very affordable land. And it's two, it was an orphanage, it was two buildings. So you can sort of still see the, the um, outline of them. And they added this additional wing between them, which gives you this floor plate. At the ground floor, um, you have this fantastic big, large shared space that can, can accommodate the whole building. So big dining room, outdoor space, and some of them have big barbecues in there and get the whole neighbourhood around. And then there's a series of small spaces, lounges and things at the ground floor. Um, and again, I've been through, I won't go through the floor plan again, I've showed you that. And just to give you a sense of how the spaces work, this is the big, lazy outdoor stair, which gives this whole secondary play space for children, but also um, it's the space where the different clusters come together and share space. This is the dining room of the, one of the clusters that I went into. Um, the living space is around here with the kitchen here. And this is the sort of the front outside looking in. Now, this is another project called Co-op Housing at the River Springfield. It's a different co-op structure. Uh, it's in Germany, in Berlin. It's on the river. Um, you can see here, it's three buildings. I think what's interesting about the fact that it's three buildings is that they're recognising that there's a maximum of 30 groups that can negotiate difference, and after that they need to split into, somehow split. So whether that's split into a 
new building or split, which seems to be the most sort of obvious and literal split. Split, but I wonder whether one might also split within a, you know, within a management committee within a larger structure. But again, that requires a different kind of leadership. So what's interesting about this project is another cluster. So it's a larger cluster. So it's across two floors. Um, and there's 11, nine bedrooms in this, so they're the darker colour, so a couple downstairs and a whole lot upstairs. Um, this is their kitchen, this is the position of the buildings, these are the buildings here on the river, this amazing boat shed down on the river. Um, there's the, di the dining room table of one of the spaces, and these are the buildings, like this beautiful series of cascading balconies. This is the kitchen that I went into, this is one of my photos. And these are these beautiful balcony sort of fringes all around the building. And the balconies, of course, it was spring when I was there. It's an amazing time to be in Berlin. So equally, so if there's innovations at the dwelling unit, there's also innovations at the block. Because you can't think, if you're beginning to chip away and pull apart what constitutes the modern family, then you also have to then ask questions of what happens at the scale of the block. Because that's the next cluster, that's the next collective of interest. And certainly in Australia and the UK, we often share things at the scale of the block. We might share a laundry, you know, we might share um, a gym more commonly, we might share garden space on the roof, but these are really becoming much more sophisticated. So this is the series that we look at. We've already spoken about um, spree field houses, this is craft work. The craft work cooperative then developed this one called Kalkabrite, which is in the center of Zurich and has, is experimenting with much larger clusters of apartments. And this is one in Zurich as well, but um, Mesa Warren. But I'll talk to you about this one called R50. This is, has been uh, developed through a cooperative system in Germany called the Baugrouping system that you may have heard of. It's um, been around for 20 years now and is 10% of housing production in Germany. So at 10%, that's enough for it to have a considerable influence on the demand that the public is making of developers for developing different kinds of shared amenity. And I think what's really interesting about this is it's led by architects, right? So the architects aren't just members of the community, which is in what's happening in many places. Here, this group is led, the architect leads. The architect finds a, a group of people, often because a municipality or a council has a piece of land and they've put out a call and they've said, would anyone like to come forward with an expression of interest to use this land? Often, not always, the judgment of who is most um, eligible to get hold of that land uh, will be based on a design competition. So design excellence is built into the process, which means that everyone's having to think differently about what it is that they want. And then now, because it's been around for 20 years, the process is entrusted. So there's mortgage um, you know, finance is in place now. There's big institutional lenders that lend money to these people, and there's legal contractual structures between groups that are trusted. And so for these guys, one of the big innovations that they've developed is a whole lot of shared space at the ground floor. So this is the ground floor here. They've got a big communal space that looks like this, which has this relationship to the street. And what they ask themselves, which I think is incredibly interesting, is if we make our apartments slightly smaller, does that mean that we can then produce a series of smaller studio-like spaces so that if we've got children that are moving between households because their families are separated, so that's one of these great new demographic changes, certainly in Australian and English cities now, is that you get children that are incredibly mobile on a weekly basis between households. It means that you can have a smaller apartment, but you can have a studio apartment that's on your floor or in your block. So you can have a teenager, probably not a little kid, but you can have a teenager come and stay there on every second weekend or every weekend, whatever they do. Right? So it's a, all in-laws, all friends, you know, but there is an amenity that compensates for the fact that you're building small and more affordable apartments that shared amenity. And this is again, they have these incredible roof spaces that are shared and different groups at different times take up responsibility for farming and then using it for growing food. And then this is co-op housing, and this, these guys really took much more seriously the issue of shared spaces. So what they've done is that the ground floor of each of their three blocks, they've the corner in that space, in that space, and in that space, 
they have really considerable shared amenities. So I think right. In this one, they've got a commercial kitchen um, and a commercial caterer. But the commercial caterer that's in here, the commercial kitchen. In this one, they have this huge, huge um, uh, dance studio, which I'll show you. And in this one, they have a childcare centre. And in some of the childcare centre just uses all of the shared space as its outdoor play area in a way that only the Germans can do where they trust children not to run away. Build <laughs> 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 all of us with horror. Um, so just to show you here, so this is the shared dining room that they use, and they're really beautiful spaces. <laughs> this is the sort of dance yoga space that they have classes in. This is a shared boat shed they have. This is the kids outside playing in their break when they're outside. And then this is the final, this is the final German one I'll show you. Also, this is a bowerbrooking project, it's called Big Backyard. And their really incredible innovation is this space in here. So just to show you the section, they have produced this huge green space, it's quite narrow, and then all of these living spaces. So typically the the, the, ter the townhouses are sort of uh, narrow and tall, so they'll be four floors. And their living space opens straight out here onto this green space. And when they first moved into this building, into this project, there were 60 children under the age of 10 in this building. And what it meant was that all of them could be out here in the shared space with only one or two adults supervising them, and they were fine. Which is an incredible use of labour, you know, when everyone's working, right? It's great. Otherwise, every, every child just has a mother with it. Or a, father or you know, some responsible adult. So this is what it looked like um, from the inside and it's a really beautiful space. The final project I'm going to show you is, is a new one that we've only found this year um, called uh, La Borda in Barcelona in Spain. There's a young practice of architects involved and it's a, it's a proper cooperative within Spanish law. It's a young court group of um, architects called La Cole that are involved in it, not leading it, but as community members. So they're just contributing their specific skill set like many other community members are. So there's lawyers and accountants and doctors and, you know, non-professionals and lots of different people working on this cooperative. But we think really what's so interesting about this project is the um, provision it makes for aged care, which is just exceptional. And then, of course, like most of the others, it has a really sophisticated sustainability argument that it's making. So it's essentially all developed around an internal core, and what's essential to it is this huge triple height space, which is a sort of an almost like a daycare, a centre for an aging population. And then it's got this very beautiful double, um, double access apartments with winter gardens at one end. Um, but what's really interesting about La Border, I think, is the degree to which this incredible, incredibly diverse group of people have negotiated amongst themselves around and through the design process. So just to show you some images of it, this is the total amount of development that it is. This is what it looks like. It's got this just really iconic facade, which is that image we showed you. It's got a very innovative um, timber construction system. It's part of this very big... Um, industrial development area in Barcelona and it sits within that, so there are all those factory sheds in the last photo, it sits within that, so it's quite modest, you know, it's tall and modest for its site, and that's the site right there. This is the section again, that's the 3D, but where you start to get this really interesting sense of what's going on is by the time you get off the first floor and into this, this, these really incredible spaces on the fifth floor that are all shared spaces. And so you can see from images like this, there's just this incredible degree of negotiation that's been going on through the design process. So I show you this work and I will tell you that I'm someone that is filled with horror at the idea of grassroots activism and negotiating this kind of politics. Like it is not, I'm Australian, you know, we, we outsource this kind of thing. We just don't get involved in it. But so I'm so all of that, you know, I'm sort of this it's not it's not the thing that I'm naturally drawn to. I know that many, many people are, but what I can see going on here is the most interesting spatial innovation that's happening in housing anywhere globally, in a way that 
in a way that is able to be normalized and replicated at scale. And so the really important thing to happen with all of this now is to find the mechanisms that allow it to scale up. And I think the bowel movement process is showing us the way, given that it's 20 years old and it's 10% of housing. What's happening in Australia at the same time is um, a system called Nightingale, if you want to Google that, which has had to develop for a really particular set of legal constraints within Australia around, in around investment. But I think, if, you know, you see images like this, I think that, um, that there's really something very interesting going on with all of these projects. Just some final images of uh, So coming back to city design, just to give you a quick account of how we're working with these ideas. We partner in London with British Land, who is one of the, se the second largest property developer in the UK. We're working on a site called Canada Water in Southwark in South London, which is a 46 hectare urban renewal site. Um, we are working on innovations in the way that we use um, uh, new uh, programmatic um, conditions at the ground floor to address uh, the temporal um, condition of development. So understanding whether the development of this site um, takes 10 to 15 to 20 years to unfold and that it needs pioneer occupation. And that we know we've got a couple of really interesting opportunities on the site which address some big, these big problems. One is we've got three large um, national health service hospitals, NHS hospitals around the site. And so that raises for us a whole lot of questions around key worker housing, how London's pro producing affordable housing, um, and a couple of key issues around aged care and how we're dealing with temporary accommodation for um, older people that are coming in and out of those hospitals. So we're looking at that and we're looking at knowledge economies and new innovation environments around lifelong learning in response to transformations in the economy. So we work really closely with, um, these are our students, this is us on site. Um, we're studio based, so it's a design based program. We go on many, many site visits and we're working with colleagues in practices such as AFNI who are working, who have just won a whole lot of rewards for a new RK project, which is the one on the left in Leeds in the north of England. Um, we work with people like this. This is Mark Greeley in, um, on the Old Kent Road looking at the consequence of the loss of light industrial space in central London and how we might begin to get that back as part of our program. We do office visits a lot and we have a really innovative um, practice mental scheme. So our students spend six to eight weeks in their fourth term in practice writing their thesis. So we partner them with practices that are interested in their work. So we're working with practices like ACME, which is here, with Arup, with, um, we hope, with Fosters at some point, with the Greater London Authority. So we work with municipalities as well. So we're really able to tailor this experience to students as they work out what their um, focus and interests are. And then we do a couple of site visits and big workshops here. So one is for Barcelona, because we love Barcelona. Uh, this is us, um, and we have the School of Architecture has a, a partnership at the moment with the Barcelona and Commune, looking at innovations in the urbanisation of healthcare through Barcelona. So this is Tone Font, who works with the Barcelona municipality. And this is Florence and Pratt, who are great friends of ours that we went to visit their studio. This is Chris Lee, who's a supporter of ours, um, who I did, was working with at the Architectural Association at one stage here, um, is the professor of practice in the GSD at Harvard and comes in and works with us when he's in London and he's at practice with Siri. And this is, um, and we work on housing as well, particularly, and this is Paul um, Karakusevich, who's an expert in housing in London. So we also run a symposium, and the one we're most proud of, I mean, some of you may be familiar with the work we've been doing with architectural type, which is on the left, and this is the basis for the Journal of Architecture Special Edition we're about to do, but the one on the right, which is happening in April, is bringing together all of the architects and the projects that I just described to you to have a discussion about this relationship of design as the site of the negotiation of difference. And we're bringing them together with one of the new emerging community groups in London and they're looking at something called community land trust and have it and make them the power day. But our second workshop is in Hong Kong. So we spent two weeks in Hong Kong working on density. So for the, in your studio this morning, we were talking about um, the point where the high speed rail comes into Istanbul. Or you know, the idea that there's this part of the one built one road arrival of the heavy rail 
So this is where we were looking at its departure point in Hong Kong, because this is what we, this is the Kowloon high speed rail connection point up into to um, Guangzhou. And of course, this is saying, you know, suddenly everyone in Hong Kong is going to be connected directly to Europe. This sort of, I'm not really sure how quickly that happens yet. Um, so this is Hong Kong, you know, we love it. But of course, it's the it's the intimacy, it's the scale of the intimate city that we're also always working. So this is us, me on the left, and Patan Azai that teaches with us, and this is the city of Hong Kong. So thank you. I hope it makes more sense than how we do what we do. So thank you. Thank you. Keep going to the phone. It's quite fun. We have a good time. Does anyone want to ask any questions or make any comments? Yeah. Uh, I know there are cases of Homes for workers, young workers, yeah. and uh, for students. Uh, there are similar cooperatives, but uh, there are not cooperatives. Uh, in Turkey or in? No, in uh, France. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, but the process of socialization is not the same. Uh -huh. uh, people are not socializing. Uh, in the same way, because um, I think there there is the participation of uh, every actor yeah. of the project. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there, um, everyone is socializing on the same way <coughs> because there are students, because there are workers, yeah. and uh, then we can see that a new uh, way of relation. Uh, are growing, yeah. but uh, this space and this space are controlled by um, the government. Yeah, in, in France. Yes, they are constructed uh, in destination to students, in destination to workers. Yeah. But uh, generally, we can feel that this is a sort of concentration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in the case of Cooperatives. How can we uh, prevent uh, this uh, problem of uh, concentration? I mean, that's a really interesting question. You know, in the 1920s, I think the 1920s was the last period when we had great experimentation in housing, and often it was because the unions got together in the city like New York and built great cooperative housing. You know, the Neen Workers Union and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union built these huge housing projects for their workers and they experimented with taking the kitchens out of the apartments and sharing them and having libraries because they needed to educate everyone and childcare because they needed to liberate women or women weren't fully in the home yet, you know. So, I think, so, so there have been sites of innovation before. But I think what's really interesting about what's happening now, and the reason why I'm even asking the question, we're even able to ask the question, is that it comes back to this question of resilience, right? And this idea that to be resilient, we need institutions of civil society that are capable of negotiating difference. And that equitable societies are great places to live. Inequitable societies are really awful places to live unless you're really, really rich. And so we're all interested, if you care about that stuff, we're all interested in looking around and going, what are the mechanisms that innate, that allow, that stop this kind of thing, what you're describing? And to me, I mean, there's just a moment where I go, I'm just not sure I've got the energy to be involved in this, because I look at my friends, my colleagues, who are really into this stuff, and they're not into it for the, for the same reasons that I am. I'm into it because I can see design and Spatial, innovation and spatial performance. They're into it because they just see civil society and a richness to cooperative society, right? and a richness to collective life. But it means that they've got this incredible patience with how they negotiate with each other and how they cultivate the skills of negotiating dispute amongst so many different kinds of people. So I think to me what it suggests is that we've got to you know, the, the, the only reason, the only way through what you're describing is to, we've got to find the mechanisms that enable us to come together and navigate difference. 
And I think where the countries that have been really successful at this, and of course, you know, the reason why I hold the American example up is because America is the master of this through the 20th century. And that's why Katrina is so disappointing, right? Because it's just like how, or, and also to recognize also that it's uneven, right? There's never going to be a system that's evenly distributed and working evenly everywhere. Um, but I think um, they, they, they had some institutional forms, and so I keep speaking about institutions that were really good at this. And I think one of them is public schools. But like public schools that, that um, are really important because they bring together many different kinds of people around the problem of the child. And the problem of the child means they have to negotiate their differences to the good of all the children. And so these schools have become these great engines for negotiating and ameliorating difference through the 20th century when America was undergoing enormous amounts of, um, of migration, immigrants coming in and new populations of people coming in. It was the school that became the mechanism for negotiating that. With varying successes, right? And the whole way that these instruments work is that we always think they're a core part, so we're always activating it to fixing them and you know, correcting them. But I think that it's how, you, and this is why I think these cooperatives are interesting, right? Because in a way, the design process is the mechanism that starts to allow that negotiation around the drawing. And that's why for us in city design, what we really want to do is to bring other disciplines around the drawing and, and empower them to be better with us around the drawing. So it's not a, you know, whatever, it's an architectural drawing, it's an urban drawing, it belongs to urban design, whatever. It's the drawing and it's the spatialization and the negotiation of difference in the design process that's what that is what matters. Okay, thank you. Uh, question. I, I have this question. Just because uh, we see that uh, and uh, some politics, but not uh, all the politics, they are uh, constantly trying to um, change the concentration of people according to their social points. Yeah. Uh, they are trying to mix uh, them yeah. and uh, make something uh, in sort of uh, that they maybe can live in the same uh, place, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the trains are not uh, very su successful. Well, there's that, uh, there's that argument. We see in, 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 in a lot of cases that yeah. uh, people uh, which are disagreeing with the other social place yeah. as, uh, are living after a few years, and uh, this house uh, are uh, empty, of, uh, there, are, there is no living person on this, on this uh, house yeah. um, because they are not uh, well uh, well finished. But uh, in the case of cooperatives, I see that uh, the process of participa participation mm -hmm. of each actor uh, can uh, add a new uh, thing, which is uh, the responsibility mm -hmm. and uh, the volunteer of uh, each person, mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. if I don't want, I don't mm -hmm. want to participate to the uh, majority. Yeah. But uh, we need to uh, socialize, socialize uh, with other places if uh, we want to distract uh, the question of power that you yeah. uh, said uh, in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, in this case, I ask to me, to myself, if this is a question of uh, architecture or, or a question of uh, personal conscience or really uh, there is uh, powers who don't want uh, people uh, live with each other. With each other. Sure. sure, there's lots of people who don't want to live with each other. But I mean, this is one of the failures of the liberal left is that we're not making good arguments to counter um, why we shouldn't live together, right? We're not making good enough arguments. We're taking for granted um, that everyone knows what's good about it. You know, so I think that we need to get better at living that. Uh, living with, with each other uh, in terms of the social points, because uh, there is part of, uh, in which uh, you can uh, go out and there is a bank, you can sit there, you can talk with uh, other people. But generally, uh, you are part uh, of the same social place. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking just about that. Yeah. Uh, the the, a lot of, there's a lot of train uh, 
to uh, break this uh, element. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this kind of project uh, doesn't work. I don't know why. And uh, I wish to know if the cooperatives give a good results. Yeah, I mean, I think they do, but they're, they're, they're all working in very specific environments, and I think it's important to know how long it takes to develop the ethics and norms of being together. And so the Bauer group in Germany, Germany is already a very egalitarian society that compared to lots of other places, and they had a history of cooperatives, and now the Bauer group, which is the specific one that's been in place for 20 years. So of the Swiss, so of the Spanish, you know, the Barcelona people are really, have a really strong egalitarian drive. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's easier for it to work in some places than others, perhaps. Yeah. Sort of Any other questions? Comments? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I wonder um, the flexibility uh, topic. Actually, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, you said uh, someone, someone said uh, we need to uh, flexibility, uh, not just for our houses, also for us. Right. Uh, how can okay? Uh, we are. I'm not. I'm not yet uh, architect, but how can I think or uh, we create the flexibility to my uh, product or mm -hmm. I think well, I think what I'm saying is that it's because it's because why I ask you that mm -hmm. uh, because um, okay this idea is really um, super we uh, live together and uh, we can uh, communicate and uh, we are not gonna uh, alone with uh, a small space, mm. uh, but uh, people need some also uh, private or safe alone space mm. with uh, with a um, a large of uh, people. How can we uh, we create this? Uh, We've all got their own spaces, and all of these all of these environments. Everyone has their own space. They just have their own space in a different, in a slightly different form, and it does require. I wonder how family. how can uh, we uh, achieve uh, the flexibility? No, my my criticism was on flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think what we typically say to ourselves is when we 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 confront with demographic change, for example, mm -hmm. so lots of people aging and living alone. We we don't say what, yeah, I, yeah yeah yeah, but we don't say what we say. We don't say. What is it that's going on here in the drawing? We say we need to make housing more flexible, or we need to be more flexible. And I, I don't think that's right. I think that's a problem. I think they both get it wrong because I think flexibility is the project of modernity. It's a kind of dynamism, right? We always have to either we have to move through the city, we've got to be more dynamic, or the plan has to, the walls have to move and the things have to move and everything has to move. And I don't think that's that's not the problem, right? The problem is that the plant embedded in every single domestic space, because you know, because you can already read it, most of you would just be able to look at a plant. If someone could just give you an unmarked drawing and you would know exactly what it is based on the hierarchy of spaces. Right? Hierarchy of space is a great mechanism of modernity. Embedded in that plant is already everything that can be said about who we are relative to each other. We, it's like I go back to those older women living with those young children that aren't their own. Who are they to each other? We don't know, right? Because we haven't given them a name yet. It takes time for us to find the newness. Like what is the constant question of how you constitute the new? And it's only in times of great trauma, either from natural disaster, meteorite strike, or warfare, that you end up with a tabby variety. Otherwise, the process of becoming new is one of displacement, not of one of like new from nothing. You know, the only people that think that are the out of the edge, it's a kind of fantasy and not being happy. So it's how how newness happens in the middle, in the center, in the absolute banal middle ground. That's where it's most interesting and most difficult. And we know one wants to work with too.
But the bathroom is how the people own their apartments. And and the bathroom is a completion property. So it's really only a property to get the building up and out of the ground. And then they can just go to a standard ownership The corporate like part of that I showed you is people buy memberships for corporate and then they pay a fee a fee, a very nominal fee to be um, resident. And then I think what's very interesting about profit, which I don't think I said, is that then once the individuals are allocated in each of those clusters, then the cluster becomes autonomous from the umbrella property. So they're responsible for their own negotiation of disputes. If someone leaves, they're responsible for finding someone else. And they just operate the autonomous, which is really important, right? Because each of them is cutting their own way through the units and how they live together. Um, so there's some, some really interesting work to be sort of done in post occupancy evaluation of what's going on in the department. Yeah, so it really, it, they, they're all different, they all approach 